Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here at the Center for a New American Security, one of Washington's top think tanks, to talk to Richard Fontaine, uh, who uh, heads uh, CNAS and uh, for a very long time was a staffer uh, for uh, Senator McCain. Uh, Richard, my condolences. You. Uh, you worked uh, exceptionally closely with Senator McCain, both uh, in the Senate but also on his uh, presidential campaign. Um, Talk to us, you know, it's, it's been a time of remembrance. You've uh, been on the circuit as well, talking uh, about the senator's legacy. From your standpoint, at this critical time in American history, talk to us a little bit about Senator McCain's legacy, why he was such an important force in American foreign and security uh, policy. Uh, for, for so long, his entire career was characterized by um, always fighting very, very tough issues, whether on behalf of, of uh, men and women in uniform, but also more broadly about the ex idea of American exceptionalism. Talk to us from the standpoint of somebody who worked so closely with him, what his legacy uh, is going to be. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Um, you know, Senator McCain, first his legacy is one of service to the country, not just because of his own service to the country, 60 years of his life spent in service to the country. Um, but because of how much he believed in the nobility of service to America and how much he believed in America as a force for good in the world. And that then tied into his view of American exceptionalism. You know, he often said that the most clear path to a meaningful life is to serve a cause greater than your own self-interest. And he never quite put it this way, but I think he felt that way about the country as well, that if America was just about let's pursue our national interest, narrowly construed security, economics, let's get ours and let other people sort out their own stuff. That was not enough, that to have a meaningful national life, America had to be a force for good for its own people and people around the world, and that's more or less how he organized his approach to foreign policy and national security. So I think that will be a major legacy. Um, do you, who now, th throughout his career, he had an ability to galvanize others to action. Uh, even in this current administration, when he would speak up, other members, for example, of the Republican Party would speak up if they had questions or were challenging uh, some of the things that the president was doing or saying. Who f you saw that firsthand. How did that work um, so consistently where once John McCain spoke, you would see not just his own party, but also the Demo members of the Democratic Party stand up and say, you know what, this is an important cause, we should get engaged. Talk to us about how that worked and how he was able to, to be that leader so consistently during his tenure in office? Well, I think there were a couple of pieces to it. First, he had the credibility and stature to take on positions that others would have felt nervous to. Per perfect example of this is his opposition to torture. Uh, not very long after 9-11, when the country was in a, a scared state of mind, it was politically, uh, you know, potentially poisonous to look like you were sort of pro-terrorist rights or something like this, but John McCain had the stature and the credibility to be able to do that. The second is he would take on those issues with some political courage and then try to lead others to the fight on them. And then I think the third thing is he was fully willing to cross party lines even when he disagreed completely uh, with folks, Republicans or Democrats, on everything else. And so another great example of this is Ted Kennedy. They had a very close relationship. They liked each other a lot. They would go down on the Senate floor and yell at each other all day and then slap each other on the back. And then they worked together, not just on immigration reform, but democracy funding for Iraq and a number of other issues that were kind of beneath the radar screen. So it was this combination of the stature and, and the leadership and the political courage, I think, with the deal making that helped make it happen. Who, who do you think uh, fills that void or is that a void that's even going to be fillable given this current generation of lawmaker? I think it is fillable, but probably not by one person. I don't think there's another John McCain that we're, we can just do a, uh, there's no plug and play to go on here. There's no sort of automatic heir apparent with the same qualities that I just described. And so, but there are people um, who have, you know, similar worldviews on many different topics and uh, have that, you know, that kind of quality. So, you know, there are folks like in the Senate, Lindsey Graham and Dan Sullivan and uh, and Marco Rubio and, and potentially Mitt Romney, if he comes in uh, on the Democratic side, you have folks like Sheldon Whitehouse and Chris Coons and Amy Klobuchar, and um, they have a bit of the McCain quality uh, here and there to their approach to politics and to leadership and into the world, really. And so I think the combined forces of individuals like that could do a lot, um, but uh, we'll have to see how our politics goes. Um, how do you respond to the thinking that 
with the with Senator McCain's demise, an entire strain of support for international, globalist, exceptionalist foreign policy basically gets drowned out entirely. Is that a concern at this point, where more and more people are um, reflecting President Trump's view of the world? The Buy America may not, um, you know, Republicans haven't stood up to oppose it as much as they would have when Senator McCain was constantly on that issue, uh, always looking at you know how to strengthen bilateral relationships between the United States and its allies to get the best capability into the hands of troops. And yet you see now on the Democratic side, the Buy America fervor is, is spreading there. How, how, how important is that going to be at a very key time for the United States when there are tensions with its allies and there was always a John McCain that you could rely on to go to conferences and to meet with people and, and to sort of try to bring them together all the time. I think it's a very genuine concern, and it was a concern of Senator McCain's because I had this conversation with him. Uh, you know, he uh, saw well before the election of Donald Trump, uh, you know, he was not in the same place as Rand Paul and some other uh, people had quite different worldviews in his own party, and that's before you got to the Democrats and his disagreements with what he thought was President Obama's uh, over retrenchment, so to speak, and so forth. And, you know, I think it's safe to say that both Republicans and Democrats, more or less since the end of World War II, have agreed on a few big things. They've agreed that, you know, in order to keep the peace, we want strong alliances underwritten by the forward deployment of American troops. In order to maintain prosperity, we want an open international economic system and more or less free trade. And to increase the forces of Freedom, we want to, when possible, support liberalism as opposed to autocracy. And so all the debates have been, how do you do that? When do you have to support a dictator because you have not much other choice? Or how big should the military be versus how small? It wasn't whether or not we do those things. And now you see, I think, diminishing support for each of those three sort of postulates. Do we actually want to support freedom and democracy for other people who don't live in the United States? Eh, it's an open question right now. What about uh, strong alliances? Well, that's under pressure right now. And what about an open economic system? There are people who just don't believe that free trade is good for the United States. And that is a real concern. And, you know, the passing of, of Senator McCain makes the, that argument that those things are good for Americans, I think, a little bit harder to, to maintain. Um, what was it uh, like working for him? I know what it was like to cover him, uh, which could be both very amusing and, and somewhat less, <laughs> less amusing. Uh, from your standpoint, what are some stories about, about, hey, this was a high note, and what were other times when you were like, oh, good Lord? <laughs> um, well, in a day, you could have three in each category. <laughs> so uh, that was the, the, the great thing, but always the, the unpredictable thing about Senator McCain was that you never quite knew what your day was going to have, uh, particularly when you're traveling with him or there was a big bill on the floor or something like that. I can remember many times uh, him calling me uh, in, while I was in the car uh, on the way to work and uh, saying you know, that he saw something on page A19 of the Wall Street Journal, and he was outraged. And as soon as the Senate came into session, he wanted to go down on the floor with a hot speech and, uh, and go denounce it. And not only did I uh, not have a speech written, I didn't even have a subscription to the Wall Street Journal. I didn't even know what he was. I was still in the car. I mean, he was in the office. I didn't know what he was talking about. So we'd have to then have that conversation. And I'd go in and try to scribble down a few notes or something like that. And then, you know, maybe get three bullet points out of the printer while we ran down to the Senate floor and he was off and running. Uh, and he was, you know, he was a, a member driven person in that respect in, in a lot of different ways. Um, and so there, there were a million different uh, things that both exhilarating but unpredictable. Um, and then, you know, he also, as everyone knows, had the um, habit of speaking in public a lot and speaking his mind in public a lot. And every now and then, as a staffer, you would prepare something very carefully and then a little bit like watching a high wire act. He gets to the end, okay, 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 you know, he did, you know, he's, he's okay because, uh, you know, uh, he always would speak his mind. And, and most of the time when he spoke his mind, it actually, you know, improved whatever you thought the message should have been. But notice I use the word most of the time, uh, at least from my, my judgment. And so, uh, like every human being, he was by no means perfect and uh, by no means a, a candidate for sainthood. Uh, and so you, you know, had a, a complicated, uh, great man of history that you were dealing with on a daily basis, and it was exhilarating in a lot of ways. 
Um, uh, that's right. Um, but he could also say things to people that made cooperation a little bit harder, but he never understood why the other person <laughs> took it so seriously. Well, it, Senator McCain was a man of very strong convictions, uh, and he felt very strongly about them. And he also had uh, this view that he could just, you know, be as clear, let's say, as clear and direct uh, and have the most vigorous exchange of ideas that one could possibly imagine. And then two hours later, you talk to the same person, all right, old pal, what are we going to do together? Let's go do, have fun and stuff like that. Not everyone responded, uh, sort of snapped back uh, to mean emotionally uh, sometimes after those things as, as quickly as he did. I mean, I saw this as a, as a staffer. Sometimes I would be on the uh, the receiving end of uh, a little straight talk, shall we say. And uh, and then, you know, by the end of the conversation, he'd start calling me old pal, even though I was a staffer and I was four decades his junior. And, you know, we would talk about something else and we're off and running and it's just par for the course. Um, and so that was part of John McCain, too. Uh, that's right, because if you agreed with him, then you were on the side of right. And if you disagreed with him, there was somehow you were somehow bankrupt and, and, and just not quite there uh, in his view. Well, especially on a lot of these foreign policy and national security issues. I mean, if it was something on ethanol subsidies in Iowa, I think you could probably see, you know, the need for a little pragmatism here and there. Or, you know, there's some of these issues where there were, you know, two sides of the story and something like that. But when it came down to, you know, oppression of people in foreign countries or uh, the consequences of withdrawal from Iraq or uh, something like that, yeah, he felt very strongly about it and felt that there was one right side and the other side was not. Uh, he uh, was known for uh, having a temper but also a very good sense of humor. Uh, I think this is one of the cooler uh, photographs. Uh, I mean, you're not only, uh, Richard, are you at the South Pole, but you're at the South Pole with John McCain and with an inscription. <laughs> I'll, it, tell us the story about the picture and, um, and use that as a springboard for uh, Senator McCain's uh, sense of humor. Well, this was about, I don't know, 10 years or maybe 12 years or so ago, and we went down, obviously, to Antarctica, and we visited the South Pole, and uh, we were looking at some climate change issues, which is a big priority of his at the time and so forth. And uh, so we stood there, and I had a camera and handed it to somebody. And what you can't see here is uh, Senator McCain literally seconds before this turning to me and said, Richard, we'd better make this quick because I'm beep freezing, um, which I hope I can beep on your show. And then, uh, but my favorite part about it and the reason why it's on my wall is uh, in here in my office is his inscription to Richard, this is where you belong, John. And to me, that encapsulates a lot of his humor. He did uh, threaten to leave me in Ernest Shackleton's hut while we were in Antarctica, and I chose to interpret that comment humorously and think I was right. But that's the humor of John McCain. Uh, well, you, you got a twofer. I, I once met uh, Sean Connery at the Taj Mahal, but uh, there, nobody memorialized that, and I, I didn't get a cute <laughs> note from him either. Uh, but uh, moving, uh, moving along, um, there were, there's a lot of discussion now. You know, I think everybody appreciates and, and sees um, Senator McCain as a hero. Um, obviously, the president had made some comments uh, about that. But, you know, you noted uh, when, when we've spoken about this that that's not what bothered him uh, in particular. Talk to us about one of the, the issues, particularly from the campaign, and why it bothered him as much as it did, because you, know, you mentioned that that is something, uh, with the Khan family specifically, was something that really upset him. Can you, can you tell us a little bit why? Sure. And, and I've seen you know, a few articles and things over time that said, well, you know, the, the sort of breaking point for John McCain was when uh, Donald Trump didn't call him, said he wasn't a war hero. He likes people who weren't shot down. I had conversations with Senator McCain after that comment, and he never even brought it up. It really wasn't an issue. I mean, here's a guy who forgave the North Vietnamese. I mean, he's not going to hold uh, a grudge about some offhand comment like that uh, when it is about him. Uh, and I think he was, his ego was perfectly fine after that. And I think it would be perfectly fine despite the debates about how long the flag is or is not at half staff around the White House. I don't think he would care at all. What he did care about is the overall direction of the country, and he cared about the respect paid uh, to those who have given the ult ultimate sacrifice in, in the battles that we have chosen to put them into. And so when candidate Trump went after the Gold Star family, the, the Khan family, uh, after their presentation at the at the Democratic Convention, I really think that affected him pretty deeply because uh, not only was it uh, completely disrespectful, but it was also 
um, a signal of at least what one ultimately willing politi winning politician thought resonated with a large section of the American people, and that's not a good thing. And uh, one, one last question. Had uh, Senator McCain uh, uh, survived and, and not succumbed to uh, the aggressive form of cancer that, that killed him, what do you think would be some of the issues that he would have been championing? You know, he, he left in December. Um, and didn't come back to Washington, was undergoing treatment until relatively recently. Um, you know, friends were always saying what his physical condition was like, that his mind was still sharp, but, but the cancer was taking its toll. Had he survived, what do you think would be some of the issues that he would have gone charging into the, you know, you, 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 you know everybody's always said he was somebody who would always charge toward the guns. Right. What do you think some of the major issues would have been that he would have been championing? Well, in foreign policy, there was certainly his deep skepticism of Russia and Vladimir Putin's intentions, which went back a long time. Uh, and unfortunately, I think he felt vindicated in his, his assessment, and I think he would have um, pushed for a, a tough approach to Russia, um, and, and even tougher than, than we're seeing today, particularly in the, on the rhetorical side uh, when it comes to the president and some of the statements and things like that. So I think Russia is one. Um, there, of course, are the nearly, I hate to say the nearly forgotten wars that we're in, but those were always important to him. The fact that we have troops in harm's way in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Syria, he visited those places, he never stopped going there, he always cared about those theaters and how that was going. On the defense side, uh, I think that he would uh, be very happy that we're having a, a, a defense budget that is you know, north of $700 billion this year and we'll have another next year. Uh, the concern would be, well, what happens after that? Uh, do we fall off a cliff or not? And what kind of budget deal? And how does this square with our overall debt and deficits? And then how are we actually going to spend that money? Are we, really in a, are we really in a great power competition mindset? Are we really focused still on terrorism? And, and you know, how, how, do, how do we divvy up those, those robust dollars, but not infinite dollars? And, um, and then finally, he became increasingly uh, interested and, and worried about cyber and technological vectors for manipulation of our economy, of our infrastructure, of, uh, as we saw our political system, uh, by malign actors and how we should deal with that. And so I think those would be some of the issues. Um, I mean, maybe I can just say one last thing that I've reflected on in the, the past couple of days uh, as I've been sort of watching the response here. And you know, I mean, the, the, the response to Senator McCain's passing has been worldwide and across party lines in the United States and really been quite exceptional. And of course, given my affection for the guy and everything else, I think a lot of this is the man himself. But I don't think all of it is the man himself. I think part of it is also a yearning to come together behind something, to say that there is an alternative to the at each other's throats way of doing politics. The, you know, I'll, I'll go on Fox and you go on MSNBC and we'll issue dueling press releases and denounce each other and, and all of this other kind of stuff. Because, you know, McCain was a, he was a politician, but he did do things a different way. And, and I think um, you see a little bit of the hunger for that in the popular response to this passing. And what was the most important lesson you learned from him? Oh, that's hard to say. Um, I learned a lot of lessons uh, for him. Um, but it, it's, it's it, probably the most philosophical was actually not long after I started working for him. I had never met John McCain until I interviewed for a job with him. And suddenly, here I was spending all this time with someone who couldn't walk anywhere without everybody recognizing him and, and everything else. And I asked him, not long after I began working for him, you know, what is it like to, you know, you can more or less go anywhere and do anything and call anyone, and everybody's got a strong view. They like you, they don't like you, whatever it is. And he said, you got to remember it's all transient. He said he, his great mentor was, was Mo Udall, the, the congressman from Arizona, who was a Democrat, but took him under his wing when McCain came to Washington. And he said, you know, at one point, Mo Udall was the most recognized person in Arizona. He couldn't walk down the street of Phoenix without getting stopped a hundred times. But he passed away in a nursing home in Bethesda, and Senator McCain used to go and read the newspapers to him on Sundays and things like that. And he said, you got to remember you got to keep it all in perspective. He said, you know, especially in politics, especially in policy, especially in Washington, it's all transient. You go from here to zero and back again in no time. And so you got to have, you know, confidence in what you're doing and a cause to fight for, uh, you know, a cause greater than yourself, not just your own personal ambitions. Richard Fontaine, former staffer for Senator uh, John McCain, who also heads the Center for a New American Security. Thank you very much for your time. And our deepest condolences again. Thank you very much. Thanks.